My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I was asked recently to make a presentation to Truth Poured Out, a group of young adults in the Diocese of Lake Charles. The topic was to be my choice, so I decided to share some thoughts on what really matters. Why? Because every day the challenges of life and society, the growing disaffection, the violence, the fragmentation, the abuse, the futile measures to address these issues remind me that we place too much confidence in human efforts. No procedures, policies, government programs, laws, and think tank conferences, however well intended and necessary, will permanently solve anything. They may give us false, some false satisfaction that now we're finally doing something about it, but they are truly bankrupt if we pursue these solutions without faith in God. Hence, I ask myself the question, what really matters? And the answer continually comes back, God. I am writing to you to address the topic of prayer. Prayer is simply our conversation with God, and we desperately need to have a vibrant prayer life. Let us briefly mention what prayer is not. When we make a decision to pray, we often turn to a technique this is not the best approach. As a matter of fact, it has never been the approach of our finest Catholic spiritual writers. The great Catholic masters of the spiritual life would have denied emphatically that their teachings or writings on prayer could be reduced to a technique. Prayer is not a program for human development, a self-help approach to make us better human beings, or simply a good way to start our day. Prayer is life, a relationship, and an intimacy with God that no one can interrupt or deprive us of, except we who stubbornly maintain a self-willed independence in the face of our Creator. So where do we begin? With God, of course. The Master himself begins here when he teaches his disciples to pray, Our Father in Heaven. They must be the first words in our mind, on our lips, and in our hearts. God is a Father. His name is holy, and we should keep it so. We want his kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. I wish to delve into that petition of the Our Father, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What I'm about to say is based on a personal experience from many, many years ago. So often when we go to prayer, it is because we are having a difficulty that seems insurmountable. Some of us face these challenges more than others, but they confront all of us regardless of our hu feeble human efforts. Here is where thy will be done made a profound impression on me. When we say those words to God the Father, in effect we are saying, here is a problem I cannot solve. As a matter of fact, I can never solve any of my problems. Submitting to your will is a supreme act of freedom and professing faith in your will to be done on earth and in heaven, I am saying, you know what is best and what happens must be and will be your will. I must simply submit something that we must resist in this modern society with its obsession over egotistical independence. But this submission is to a God who loves us and is love itself. In being selfless, this submission resists the ego in this lies the essential difference. God is and should be everything for the Christian. In the simple realization about God's will being done, I find a great deal of freedom. In embracing this trust in God's loving will, we are free to act as we should, as we must. I am reminded of the insight of St. Thomas Aquinas, quoting another great Catholic saint, St. Gregory the Great, we pray not that we may change the divine disposition, but that we may impetrate, that is, obtain by asking, that which God has disposed to be fulfilled by our prayers. In other words, that by asking, man may deserve what Almighty God from eternity has disposed to give. That quote is so rich in meaning and significance that it requires we dwell on it a while. It deserves more than one meditation. As our Father in heaven, God has charted a course which is moving toward a final consummation in him. Our imperative, what we must do, is join ourselves to that course which leads to that good. 
The sacred scriptures speak abundantly about this, but one passage from St. Paul, a favorite of mine, stands out. We know that all things work for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. That conclusion of St. Paul is the same as that of St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Gregory the Great. It should be ours also. Why do we act contrary to this divine will? We all know the answer to this question. St. James explains it this way. Where do the wars and where do the conflicts among you come from? Is it not from your passions that make war within your members? You covet but do not possess. You kill and envy but you cannot obtain. You fight and wage war. You do not possess because you do not ask. You ask but you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. The human will is the, the human will that is consumed with its passions, that covets what it cannot possess, seeks happiness in the wrong places and fulfillment in empty pursuits, can find satisfaction in nothing and finally ends by rejecting the divine will. The Our Father introduces a world and an approach that is transforming because it frees us. Prayer is the entry point to this world. For this reason, Christians down through the centuries have acknowledged the Lord's Prayer as the most perfect prayer. The Our Father is our blueprint for prayer, as our Lord Jesus Christ intended. What really matters? The answer is simple, God. Prayer is important because it is our conversation with our Father, our Creator, the origin of everything that is. He is even the origin of our interior life. Pope Francis made a Christmas gift to his cardinals of a long-neglected classic, The Spiritual Life by Adolf Tanqueray. Inspired by his gesture, I revisited this powerful work and came across the following quotation. Gathering all that is found here and there in the scriptures, we can say that God through grace is present within us as a father, as a friend, as a helper, as a sanctifier, and that in this way, he is truly the very source of our interior life, its efficient and exemplary cause. This is quite a profound observation. If God is the very source of our interior life, then we discover him by navigating the interior life by means of prayer. He awaits us, just as certainly as the mountain source of a mighty river awaits the explorer who travels its waters. Take the plunge, discover the source. Do not allow your sins to get in the way, confess them and be reconciled. For this reason, Jesus Christ gave us the sacrament of penance. Then turn off the computer, the radio and television, stop the electronic communications, omit Facebook, and seek the silence of adoration before the Blessed Sacrament, and in its absence, the quiet place which can serve as your refuge. Begin with the Our Father. What does it say? What are you refusing to hear? And most importantly, what is it saying to you? When I issued my decree on the first Sunday of Advent last year, I had the Blessed Sacrament on my mind, as we all should. I insisted on weekly adoration in our parishes. I want Eucharistic processions. These are not ends in themselves. The church gives them to us for a reason. They are means to an end of enriching our experience of Christ in his Eucharistic presence and in the celebration of Holy Mass. Is Christ not the daily bread for which we pray in the Our Father? I will return to you on this topic of prayer in the future. As I said in the letter that accompanied my Advent decree, there is much more to come, and I am pleased to share it with you. With prayers for Holy Lent and extending my blessing to you for the pursuit of what really matters, I remain sincerely yours in our Lord, Glenn John Provo, Bishop of this here diocese. I'd mention just a few things. First, that we should pray for our bishop, three Hail Marys for Bishop Provo, gratitude for his good priestly vocation and the good fatherly advice and leadership that he gives to this diocese. Hopefully you're remembering our good spiritual father in your prayers. The second is that we need to take our Lenten 
sin sacrifices and penance seriously. We reflected upon uh, fasting on Ash Wednesday. I did that with, uh, with the mind of Bishop Provo, giving us some instruction on prayer today. And certainly we'll consider other things later in Lent as well as we go through the season. But whatever we're doing, we should do it seriously and we should be resolute in our intentions. If we fall, we should get back up and start over again, not quit. We need to make this a good Lent. We need to be serious about these things and especially about prayer. All of us know, and probably no one has to explain, the temptations that come not to pray. The world is busy. We feel its demands, and it's very easy for us to get absorbed by them or overwhelmed by them. But let's think about it along these lines. What is the most fundamental aspect of man? What is the most fundamental aspect of our human nature? It's our soul. Our bodies, good as they are, begin as dust and turn back into it. But that soul goes on forever. It's an immortal soul. If we do not attend first and foremost to the needs of the soul, we are going to be frustrated beyond all measure in this life and maybe eternally in the next life. We need, for the sake of our well-being, for our happiness, for our sanity, we need to pray. We need to pray. Whatever temptation there is not to pray, we need to rebuke that, like our Lord in the gospel today. Vare Satana, get behind me, Satan. We should tell those temptations and distractions. The second thing I would mention is, have you begun making your weekly holy hour in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament? Again, Bishop Provo does not intend to sanctify this building. It was sanctified by whatever bishop consecrated it decades ago. Have you begun making your weekly holy hour in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament? This is the minimum, one hour per week in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament. If we think this is extreme, we have not been paying attention to the news in and outside of the church, in and out of the world. We must pray, things will not get better. Christians need to be on their knees, praying in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament. Stomachs need to be emptied of food. Hearts and minds and souls need to be emptied of all this noise out in the world. We need to fill our souls and our hearts with God's graces and be in his presence. Otherwise, there will be no transformation no purification, no cleansing, just sin and corruption all the day long. This is all we'll be left with if we don't become serious about this. What did our Lord say? There are some demons that are only cast out by prayer and fast. We have not prayed and fast as we should, as individuals or as a church. We have to do what works. We have to get back to it if we want healing and sanctification. So I'd ask if you've begun making your holy hour. Have you put on your calendar the Feast of the Annunciation? That's the next procession, just a few weeks, a Eucharistic procession through these streets. Those street signs are not gonna be converted. That's not what the bishop wants by having a Eucharistic procession. He wants Catholics out there on moss, encouraging, giving an example of faith so that people might be brought to our blessed Lord and praying prayers in public so that people can be brought back to the gospel. So let's ask the Lord to give us the grace to put these things first and to embrace in our lives what really matters. I would ask that you take the bishop's pastoral letter home with you and that you give it a good reading throughout Lent and that perhaps you might even be a little apostolic and pass it on and encourage other people to join us in our prayers. Again, what should we be doing during this Lent? Again, when it comes to the lines of praying, again, we have holy hour, we have adoration 13 hours almost every Wednesday. 7a till 8p almost every Wednesday. I would think that probably many of us, if not all, could make at least some time before our blessed Lord on that day. And let's say we can't. Thankfully, the Lord has given all of us a day. In fact, it's not our day, it's his day. And so we're to set aside everything for God's prerogative. We have a holy hour almost every Sunday evening at 6 p.m. We even pray Compline at the end of it. How many Catholics throughout the world wish their parish would do things like have a holy hour every evening and even chant Compline, and yet so few do? Catholics all throughout the world, even in very big cities, 
maybe like New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Boston, other places. I know they certainly do in Lake Charles. Catholics down there wish that they could go to a holy hour and Compline each Sunday night. And it's here in our backyard and we just get diverted by other things. Let's ask the Lord to help us embrace the things that really do matter.